Alright guys, so here's something that's helpful. So this antenna right here is hot. So if I touch this antenna and I bring my arm and I touch this metal pole, ow, it's live. That does not feel good. Tanner, tech, tanner, tech, tanner, tanner, tech, tanner, tech, tanner. Hello, this is Tanner Tech. And today we're going to be taking a look at and fixing this old All American 5 radio. Now I have the chassis already taken out, the chassis is sitting right here. I took this apart in a live stream where we took a look at it. But anyway, this radio has not been tested yet. I'm not going to test it with all the electrolytic caps inside there, and I wasn't going to test it with the power cord that was previously on there. So we're going to put a new power cord on this device and uh, put some new electrolytic caps inside and it should run properly, hopefully. So this is the radio. Just to give you an idea of what the power cord looked like before I got here, this is the power cord. You can see that it was duct taped together at the ends and it's so brittle and dry that I can literally just crack it like this when I break the cord and it cracks open and reveals the copper inside and falls apart. This cord is hideous. This is a little electrical plug that came with it. Uh, this cord or plug is pretty bad too. It's cracked falling apart with exposed terminals everywhere. This is definitely not a good uh, power cord. There were also battery wires coming out of this hole that I also cut out and I cut them at the sources underneath inside the chassis because these battery wires were also uh, cracking too and they were touching each other and that was bad. If I would have plugged it in like that, I could have shorted something out. Now I'm, I cut the battery wires because we're not going to be using batteries for this device because the batteries that go for a tube radio are almost non-existent nowadays and they wouldn't be useful anyway. The only time you're ever going to be carrying around this massive heavy tube radio is if you're going to move it somewhere. You're not going to take it to the beach with you and play music out of it. No, you're going to use this to plug into your wall and sit on your desk and listen to radio that way. But anyway, this is the power cord so we're going to change that out. Now, this has a total of eight tubes. I unplugged this tube so that way I could set it down. I didn't want to risk breaking this tiny tube. But anyway, we've got quite a few different tubes inside here. And we have these two electrolytic capacitors as well, which are more than likely bad. Now, typically, these electrolytic capacitors go bad after a long time. This is a Zenith branded radio, Zenith branded capacitors. And so these are probably the capacitors that were originally placed in the capacitor in the tube radio and these capacitors are extremely old this whole radio is old it's probably at least 60 or 70 years old so these capacitors had dry out because the electrolyte inside them just dries out because these are paper capacitors and some parts inside here might short out and bad stuff happens like that now there are two electrolytic capacitors one over here by the speaker and the output transformer and one over here by the variable capacitor, the tuning capacitor. Now some of you may be wondering if I'm going to be changing all these capacitors inside the radio. As you can see, there's a lot of these old paper capacitors. Now I counted approximately 20 of these paper capacitors inside the radio, and a lot of them are just plain buried underneath all these RF chokes and other things. Now I could go ahead and replace all these capacitors, but that would not be a fun experience. And also these capacitors are a lot more likely to stay good over the years than the other capacitors. Now these capacitors may have drifted in their original values and they may have drifted off spec. They may have some slight leakage inside. These capacitors are highly unlikely to damage the tube and be bad. Out of all the different types of paper capacitors that exist, these are the types that are the least likely to short out or die. And I went through with my multimeter and I checked every single capacitor without removing them if they had uh, continuity and all of them were open, which is good because if one of these capacitors is shorted, then that could break the tube. So because they're all not shorted, then that ha makes it have the minimum chance of any bad things happening to the rare tubes inside this device. So I'm not going to replace any of the uh, paper capacitors. I'm merely going to replace the uh, 
electrolytic capacitors, which are a real pain to get to because they're hidden behind here, hidden behind all these masses of other capacitors. So this is a schematic that I was able to find online that details how this radio works. And I'm going to explain a little bit about how it works. Now this radio has a few different parts inside it. And as you can see from this gigantic circuit diagram, it's extremely complicated. But if you look down to the individual parts and how each of the individual, individual parts works, it gets a little bit easier to understand. So over here is where the signal comes in from the two or three different antennas this device has. Uh, it comes into here, and here we can select the different channels that the radio will go on, the different bands. Uh, this will help us, this makes the dial more uh, precise when you're tuning it. So all this goes into something called the RF preamplifier. So basically what this tube does is it amplifies the original radio frequency signal that's coming in from all the antennas, one that has been tuned out. Now this radio is something called a super heterodyne radio, and that means it has this thing called a pentagrid converter. But basically what a pentagrid converter does is it generates a, a signal called the local oscillator, and then it mixes that signal with the signal coming from the RF preamplifier. Now the reason for the RF preamplifier is so that way you can detect very weak signals. Now after that goes into the pentagrid converter, that combines those two signals and it forms a lower frequency signal because high frequency signals are a real pain to deal with sometimes. So that signal is approximately 455 uh, kilohertz or kilocycles. So that is fed through this interstage transformer to the IF tube. This means it's called the intermediately intermediate frequency tube and that is able to amplify the intermediate frequency the intermediate frequency is used so you don't have to use such a high frequency so all the frequencies that come in from this RF tube when they're put into the uh, pentagrid converter it basically takes that high frequency and turns every single high frequency into one singular lower frequency so that is fed to the uh, intermediate frequency amplifier, which goes through another uh, interstage transformer. That is fed to this detector and amplifier. The detector and amplifier tube basically amplifies this, the signal from the IF stage, and it also detects the signal, because this is still a very high signal of 455 kilohertz, and you want to take out the audio signal from that, the audio modulated signal that's on this carrier wave of 455 kilocycles. So the detector tube will basically use a grid leak circuit to take out that specific frequency that you want, and then it will feed that into the power amplifier. Now, this differs from a lot of other radios because it has a push-pull power amplifier tube set up. That means you need another inverter tube here. Basically what the inverter tube does is it gives the signal that's coming out of the detector amp a uh, 90 degree, 180 degree phase offset, which means that it feeds one of these tubes uh, a different phase than the other tube, which is the only way you can run it in a push-pull amplifier uh, scenario. So that's basically how this radio works, and that amplifies it out to the speaker through this uh, audio transformer. We also have this tube right here. This is a rectifier tube. Now, what's interesting about this radio is it doesn't have a transformer in it. That's basically because this rectifier tube is 117 volts, and each of these tubes is 1 volt. So all these tubes are wired in series, these uh, 7 tubes. So that's 7 volts of dropping, and it seems like the tubes are fed off this uh, power supply right here with the capacitors on it. The tube filament supply is actually supplied by that, which is fairly interesting. That brings us to our most important point for discussion in this video, and that is the capacitors. So you can see we have capacitors here, and the interesting thing about capacitors and tube radios is that these capacitors are actually three capacitors in one can, and they have one common ground. Now these capacitors are 40 microfarads, 20 microfarads, 10 microfarads, and that with one common ground. And these are all at about 150 volts uh, voltage rating. This capacitor right here is 200 microfarads at 10 volts and 40 microfarads at 150 volts. So yeah, that's basically this the two capacitors or five capacitors that we're changing. Uh, we're also going to be changing the power supply cord, which goes to the wall. And yeah. This power cord is a lot newer, and it follows all the electrical specifications that it needs to, and it doesn't fall apart into dry brown powder when you hold it. So we're going to feed these wires into the socket for the 
plug and we'll solder everything into place once we flip this thing over and get inside. All right, now it's time for a quick soldering job to solder this new AC plug wire. As you can see, the plug is now fully installed and it's time to work on the first electrolytic capacitor. So I'm gonna start this off by removing this uh, resistor that's right here. Cut this one out. We'll cut all the wires and go to the capacitor. Remembering where they are, of course. Common ground terminals are a real pain to work with. After successfully removing this old vintage capacitor, we can now set this aside and start adding our new capacitors. I'm going to start by kind of making these leads available more to push through the hole so that way we can apply the new capacitors on the outside. They will all go into the common ground connection that was left by the old capacitor. So we're going to install the capacitors up here. We have this capacitor which is a 10 microfarad 200 volt capacitor. The first capacitor we'll need to install one between this line and this common point. We we'll only need one capacitor there. We're going to need to have four capacitors from here to here and only two capacitors from here to here. And so this is my 40 microfarad capacitor. As you can see it's pretty big. I made it using four of these small 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitors. So I have the right size electrolytic capacitor. For my 10 size electrolytic capacitor, I'll just be using one of them. And for my 20 size, I will be using two of them. Now how I connected them basically is I bend the leads completely out on one of them. And then I take another one and I set it right on top. And I bend the leads completely touching the sides. Then I bend these leads out and then I use these leads to fold over the sides. Well, there it is, my first electrolytic capacitor replacement. That was easy enough because it was on the corner. The next one should be a little bit trickier. But anyway, I think it looks kind of cool. It looks kind of like this tower that's made from many things just being built in a tower. I don't know, like a triple tower. Well, that is my next target right there. This should be a real pain to get at. It's buried. I'm going to replace this with two capacitors, one of them being a 100 microfarad capacitor. Uh, I need four of these actually, so wait a second. Yeah, two of these in parallel, this is 100 microfarads at 50 volts, and four of those 10 microfarads at 200 volts in parallel, so a lot. And I will get started on that one. All right, so that was a pretty tricky one. I couldn't remove the capacitor, so I just removed the wires and soldered these two wires in place. That one job alone of replacing these two capacitors was so tricky. That was trickier than a lot of tests at school. It's because you have to be so precise in your soldering and you have to solder to these multi-dimensional webs of capacitors and resistors and inductors. It's very difficult. Well now I think it's about time to give this a quick test. All right, so here's the test setup. I have this small AC amp meter hooked up in series with my Variac to the radio power supply. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly turn on the radio with my Variac just to make sure that we don't have any excessive current spikes that could show that something is wrong with our radio. Hopefully it should warm up as planned. Let's check this out. All right, we're gonna turn it on. So far I'm not seeing anything. Okay, the radio is coming alive. All right, so I just uh, took all the tubes out and I'm cleaning them off so they're all shiny and not dusty anymore. And I'm gonna put them back in so that way it should work. Now it wasn't working at first and I think that was just because uh, the tubes had gotten some corrosion in between the pins and the sockets. And so I think reseating the tubes inside there will fix it up. Alright, so this radio is being real fun to work with. 
So the issue with it is right now that I'm getting tons and tons of 60 hertz hum, even though I replaced the electrolytic capacitors. Now I was able to see if this hum was coming from inside the radio or see if the hum was coming from an outside source by using this small cassette tape AM radio. So I was walking this little AM radio around the house and around my room where the radio is and I get an overwhelming amount of 60 hertz hum. So my room is not suitable for listening to radio stations because there's just so much 60 hertz hum because there's power lines in the walls and there's solar panels right above my room and these solar panels have micro inverters that change the DC power from the solar panel to 110 volts AC. And so the electromagnetic interference from those panels up there are probably causing a lot of the interference in here which makes it almost impossible to listen to radio. Me being an Eagles fan, I love it. It's it's as good as it gets. I and mean, he's the kind of guy you want on your team. Like, it's awesome. Amen to that. Hey, by the way, the Dodgers wanted Manny Machado on their team. That's exactly what they have now. But it looks like... I, I mean, he, he was very good at shortstop in his first series against the Brewers here in Milwaukee. Uh, up close here, and he made some plays that were just like, wow. That's why the cut. Of course, the percentage of black here. Okay, this is weird. So, you saw on that radio that there was no 60 hertz hum around here. None whatsoever. The only 60 hertz hum was by that big light, which I can turn off. That's weird because in the morning, when I put the radio in that same place and I tuned it across the spectrum, everything was full of 60 hertz hum all across the board. But right now, it's completely fine. That is weird. So, my guess to why this phenomenon is happening is... Now that the air conditioner is on full blast and everything's running more in the house, these solar microinverters are under full load. And so, because they're under full load, it makes it so that way they don't have less noise, I think. But, I don't know. It, the reason behind this not working is a little bit confusing. So let's fire up this radio again and see if it works. Maybe I won't have to go a long way to find out. Who knows? Well, I can hear the radio running but nothing turns on. I mean, it's a little bit crackly right now when I turn the knob, but I think that's because there's a dirty tuning capacitor. But anyway, it should be working right now. Uh, there's a strong station on 640 kilohertz. Uh, I haven't selected, selected the broadcast band. Nothing in this section. It's completely empty. There's also a strong one on 57. Not getting anything. I pick it up perfectly on my small tape recorder. Anyway, um, not sure what the issue is. Maybe something could be misaligned inside. Uh, I think it's working fine. If you listen to this, this is pretty interesting. If I turn on my soldering iron, listen to this. Horrible 60 or some. I turn off my soldering iron. Everything sounds fine. Very cool. So as you can see on my oscilloscope screen, I put my uh, coil next to the radio. You can see that I've got a 34 kilohertz uh, signal on there. Now that signal is just from the local oscillator. I'm pretty sure. All right, so I still have only uh, 34 kilohertz local oscillator signal coming from there, which isn't the best. I haven't really gotten any significant results from this thing. Alright, so that tube radio didn't exactly work correctly yet. It still is unable to function properly. It picks up 60 hertz hum from my soldering iron just fine, but it doesn't seem to pick up any other radio station, which is strange. Now, I didn't replace any of the paper capacitors, so that could be a problem, but if there's any other way to fix this radio short of uh, recapping all the paper caps, please be sure to let me know. The electrolytic caps that we replaced uh, function perfectly. They work without a problem, which is pretty cool, but the radio doesn't pick up any stations yet. Now, I did pick up one station once, it was, it was pretty interesting. I had the radio all hooked up, and I was running it, and I came across the station. I heard someone speaking, and then as soon as it was there, it was gone, and the radio didn't work anymore. So, 
I'll leave that with you. But uh, thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time because hopefully next time I will fix this old vacuum tube radio.